Okay, so welcome to this workshop on a head start on college teaching. Thanks for coming today. And um, I have a few introductory comments. I want to introduce myself to you because I think it would be only fitting and proper that you would know where I come from and why we're here talking about teaching. Okay, so I suspect that most of you, either at some point already or in the future, will be involved in classroom instruction. Yes? Very good, very good. Okay, so well, first of all, my name is Bryce Lane, and I've, I'm a faculty member here in the Department of Horticultural Science at NC State University, and I've been at NC State for 31 years. I'm in my 32nd year, and many, many years ago when my wife and I moved here with our six-month-old daughter, we thought for sure we would end up back in western Massachusetts where I grew up in three to five years. And so now, we have lived in Raleigh 31 years. Not only have we raised one daughter, but a second daughter who was born here in Raleigh. And we now have son-in-laws and five grandchildren. So uh, my perspective relative to what I'm going to talk to you about today relative to teaching is indeed um, influenced significantly by who I am and where I came from. And so we want to talk about teaching. And um, it's a it's a subject that's very near and dear to my heart. It's something that I've, I've done for a long time. I grew up in Western Massachusetts, and when I was 16 years old, my father told me that I had to pay for half my college education. And I looked at him and I said, well, who said I was going to college? That was the wrong answer to give my father, who was college educated at the time. And so after he realigned my motivation, I found myself um, looking for a part-time job as a, a sophomore in high school. And it was either at the, this little independent garden center called the Hadley Garden Center, or it was in a place called McDonald's, cooking french fries. Those were my choices, and I picked the Hadley Garden Center for one reason and one reason only. What, what might that reason be? Anybody, any ideas? Yes? You like plants? No, I didn't even do anything with plants, yeah. Pay for Pardon me? Pay for No, no, it was just... No, in fact, they paid less. They paid less than they got. No, really, the main reason was very simply this. I enjoyed being outdoors. And so they hired me as a car loader at the Hadley Garden Center. I was the very best car loader at the Hadley Garden Center. I was so good that they asked for me. People would ask for me because I could take these bags and bring them up over that trunk latch and put the bags of cow manure in the trunk without splitting the plastic and spilling the cow manure. <laughs> and so that, you know what that got me? That got me promoted. I got promoted from, from uh, car loader to fruit tree potter, and I was such a good fruit tree potter that I got to, to be involved in fruit tree sales, and then from fruit tree sales to nursery sales. And I learned two things about myself. One, I learned that I really loved plants. And two, I learned that I really loved talking to people about plants. That was all I knew at the time. So I changed my major when I went off to college into plant science or horticulture. And at my senior year, the late Dr. George Goddard, my advisor, sat me down one day and he said, have you ever thought about graduate school? And I laughed. I actually started to walk out of his office. He said, no, really. Have you ever thought about graduate school? I said, no. I have an assistant manager position already for me when I graduate from college at the Hadley Garden Center. I was married at the time. I married young. I married my high school sweetheart, who I met at 15. Okay, we got married between my sophomore and junior year in college. I know. But we, we've been married for 35 years, so it must have worked. Anyway, I said, everything's all set, Dr. Grounded. I really don't need to be thinking about that. I said, why would you even suggest graduate school? He said, I think you'd make a good teacher. He saw something in me that I didn't even see myself. And as a result, I came back about three days later and said, Let, let's talk a little bit more about this graduate school thing. What would I have to do? How would I have to do that? And, what? and so I ended up going off to graduate school. Honestly, not for the research. I did it because I had to. But I did it. I did graduate school because I wanted to get more training in horticulture and I wanted to get experience teaching. And so I sought out ways to practice my teaching as a graduate student at The Ohio State University. And as a result, when I applied for a position here at NC State in teaching, I got the job because, only because I had volunteered to practice my craft when I was in graduate school much to the chagrin of my major professor and other graduate students who said, you'll never get your thesis done if you keep volunteering for these teaching things. And all I maintain is I wouldn't be here today talking to you about teaching if it weren't for the fact that Dr. Goddard saw something in me I didn't see myself, and 
then I took the opportunity to practice my craft, to hone my skills as a teacher while I was in graduate school. I'm not trying to change your goals and objectives with regard to graduate education. However, if teaching is going to be part of that, then this workshop I think will really be helpful in getting you started on that, that process. So that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to tell you is very simply this. We at this university value graduate student teaching assistance. Without your help, we couldn't do what we do at this university when it comes to the academic programs. So let me be the first one to say, anytime you're involved in any teaching in any department on this campus, you are fulfilling a very valuable role for this university when it comes to education. I just want to recognize the fact that that's important. I see it as very important what you do. Okay, now let's get started, okay? All right, so the way we're going to get started is I'm going to make you do your homework first. So here's your homework assignment. I want you to take about three minutes, okay, and I want you to, let's see, two, four, six, let's pair up on this side of the room, pair up in groups of two, and then the, the, you three form a group of three, okay? And here's what I'd like for you to do is get together, and I want you to, to, to talk about and answer these, these two questions. Okay, I want you to name a teacher that you have had who is just outstanding. Name an outstanding teacher you've had, that's one. And then two, talk to each other about what characteristics, what things did they do that made them so great? It's that simple. And as, as an opportunity to, when you do that, you can kind of get to know the people you're, you're with. So I'm gonna give you about two to three minutes to do this assignment, then we'll come back together and, and talk about it just a little bit. So go ahead. Up. Time's up. Good work, everybody. Thank you very much for doing that. If you maybe take your seat. So here's here's the drill. Here's what we're going to do. What I, the first thing I'd like for you to do is if I if I ask you uh, on behalf of your group to give an answer that you would uh, you just go ahead and, and do that. And the first question I'm going to ask is to actually name names. I want to hear what these individuals' names were. So Jonathan and Jared, what what was one of the names of one of the outstanding teachers you guys talked about? Uh, my teacher was Michael Poor. Michael Poor? Yeah, okay. He was my senior uh, English teacher in high school. Senior English teacher yeah. in high school. How about, how about you guys? Thank you. Okay. Um, mine was James Carver. He was a, a undergrad A graduate professor in the Department of Head of Chemical Engineering. Chemical Engineering? Ooh. Okay. <laughs> how about this group? Is so, it Go for it. I'm so sad. Anna Kennedy. Anna Kennedy, Anna Kennedy. Uh -huh. yeah. teacher in Spanish. In Spanish? Okay. How about this, the Pearson threesome here? Uh, I would say Miss Julian, my high school AP U.S. history teacher. Okay. Okay, so we had two high school and the rest college teachers. Okay, other high school teachers? Other college teachers? Okay, so now, just as a, as a group, as a whole group, rather than group by group, what, what I'd like to do is have you um, just volunteer up what characteristic, what thing did they do, whatever it was that, that, that would characterize them, what made them outstanding? What was it that they did, something they did? Anybody, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna put a running list on the board so we can see what kinds of things. Who wants to start? Yes, Susanna. Passionate about what they taught. Passionate. I didn't talk to you before this workshop and ask you to say passionate, did I? Uh -huh. No, okay. How many others passionate? Okay, look at all the passion in the room. Okay, somebody else. Jared? Instill creativity. Creativity. I like this pen. Good. Creativity. Others create, create creativeness. Creativity a little bit. Okay, someone else? Yes? Patient. Patient. Okay, good. Other patients? Yes? 
Okay, what else? Yeah, it might also sort of order passion and enthusiastic. Enthusiastic. Others, enthusiasm, okay. Yeah, these two I think are, are connected, but there might be a little bit of difference there, okay. Others, yes. caring. Caring, and Jared, help me out here. Caring, what did they care about? They cared about the students. They cared about the students, okay. Very good. Others, yes. In that same vein, encouraging. Yes. They were encouraging. Like okay. Your advisor saw something in you and actually spoke up and said, "Oh, you would be good." At this. Yeah, because I don't think I ever would have even thought about that vein as a career area within that context. He saw something in me I didn't even see myself, and if he hadn't have brought it up, boy, as a teacher, that really I feel the responsibility of perhaps trying to pay more closer attention to my students because you know. Maybe just one word for me. The other thing, if you think about this, and during this workshop, I'll just fly off every once in a while because you, know, you struck a nerve. But the other thing is think about the, the negative influence you have over your students just by something you might say or not say. So there's a lot of responsibility involved with that. Okay, what else? Diversity of teaching tools. Differentiation, I think, is what he's getting at. Yeah, and I was thinking flexible. Yeah. You know, the ability to teach the same thing in different ways. Right. Yeah. Um, diversity in, oh, I got it, technique. How's that sound? Yeah. Okay, it's diversity in technique. They, they had more than one way to do something. Okay, good. What else? Anything else? I don't want to beat this one, but Amanda? Challenging. Challenging. Ooh, how about, okay, I'll put challenging. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to put demanding, but challenging, <laughs> challenging sounds more, you know, it sounds better than well, they demanded a lot from me. What else? Anything else? Okay. Very good. That's, that's awesome. Passionate, creative, patient, enthusiastic, caring, diverse in their ability to explain things, challenging. Can I add a couple? Um, clear. Clarity. Okay. When I was 10, I lived in a neighborhood that had, was being built, and people were coming into the neighborhood, and kids, we'd all get together. Back when I was a kid, you could play outside by yourself without your parents, and, and social services would not be called. And, and so we'd go out and we'd play, and what we do? We'd play games, and games had rules. New kids were always coming, learning the games. Guess who always got elected to explain the rules? Now, there's a nudge way back when I was 10. I didn't sit there and go, I think I'm going to be a teacher because I can explain things clearly. But with, within the context of my own person, I have that somehow have, to have the ability to be able to explain things without confusing people. And so, you know, a lot of the greatest teachers I've had were people who could do that, who were very clear in their ability to explain things. So that's, that's kind of thing. You know what I find fascinating about this list? Not one, of, not one word has anything to do with knowledge. Isn't that fascinating? You know, you have identified outstanding teachers, but, but not because they were incredibly knowledgeable. And I don't mean to imply that outstanding teachers don't have to know their, their subject matter, but it wasn't something that floated to the top relative to you thinking about people who were outstanding. I did, I did the assignment too, so I need to share with you what, who's my people. Okay, number one, um, actually I did three, sorry. George, um, um, John Havis. John Havis taught nursery management in the Department of Plant Science at, at the University of Massachusetts. And the reason why he was so good is because he absolutely loved his subject matter. He was in love with nursery management. And as a result, we all fell in love with nursery management. It's like, how could anybody not love this? Some of you are going, nursery management? <laughs> <laughs> I understand. You said chemical engineering? Yeah. I went, boom, <laughs> I got a chill. Um, George Goddard, my advisor, but he loved students. He loved students. He loved being around students. His door was always open. There were always students in his office, you know, and we just were one big, giant, happy family, teacher, students. He loved students. Dr. Um, George Klaikowski, Dr. Klaikowski taught genetics. I had to take genetics. He was absolutely passionate about genetics, and he was also just thrilled to be a teacher. He not only loved genetics, but he really wanted to teach genetics, and we just we just laughed it up. So that's kind of kind of interesting. 
Okay, so this, this little exercise was just to get you thinking about what is good teaching? Because, you know, a lot of times out there in university circles, they'll say, well, you know, teaching is not something to really identify what good teaching is, what great teaching is. We can't really identify the characteristics of good teaching and then measure them. I mean, is there a passion meter in a, you know, can we, can we actually put a number to passionate or to clarity, those kinds of things. Are these, are these things we're born with or are these things that we can learn and improve upon? You know, these are the classic arguments when it comes to, to teaching. So what I'd like to do is, with that as a backdrop, take you on a journey, if you will, through what I think identifies what good teaching is. Wait, something that you can actually sink your teeth into as you enter into the classroom, the laboratory, the discussion section, whatever you might be doing with students, there are some skills and abilities that you may be able to apply. To do that, I need to create an illustration or a, a, a comparison. I would like to use quilting okay, as an example or as a comparison for, for, for teaching. I'd like for you to think of teaching as a craft. Okay? Not as a science, not as an art, not as something that, you know, one of the three prongs of the university, research, teaching, and extension. Okay, somehow teaching ends up in the middle. I'm not exactly sure why. Research is always listed first. I'm just saying. Okay, teaching as a craft. Now, how many of you have a craft? Do a craft. What do you do, Sarah? Knitting. Knitting. Okay, somebody else? John? Music making. Music. You make music. Is it in a pot? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a keyboard. Okay, so you, you, you write music. Cool. Somebody else? Turkey. You cook. Okay. All right. Did I craft? Did I cook? You cook too? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, I, I maintain that teaching is very much like a craft. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit right now about a craft. What does it mean to, to do a craft? And I'm going to use quilting as my example craft. And the reason I'm going to use quilting is because my wife is a master quilter and she quilts. And I watch her quilt. I have become familiar with her quilting. So what I'd like for you to do is think about this craft. If it's a craft, if it's a craft, there are, there are three prongs to learning a craft. There are principles. Okay, I liken that to vocabulary. All right. If you were going to learn about quilting, what would be the first thing you might do? <laughs> what might you do? Read about it? You know, develop an understanding of terms and things that relate to quilting. I call it the vocabulary, the knowledge base, the principles. There are certain principles when it comes to quilting. You know, all quilts generally have the front and they have the back. And then there's something usually in between those front and back. It's called batting, by the way. Okay, and you put the batting in between the front and the back. And then you have piecing. That's where you put the pieces together. And I could go on. Okay, but this is all the, the, all the vocabulary and the knowledge base that one has to learn when they do quilting. Okay, so that's, that's step number one of learning a craft is the vocabulary, the knowledge. Okay, that's first. Second, okay, the skills. Applying the knowledge, okay, the skills of putting these pieces together and then sewing them on a sewing machine. Skills, the skills and ability, the tools. Okay, I have a, I have a next door neighbor who's a contractor. He says the best contractors are the ones who know exactly what tool to use for what job. I'm an amateur when it comes to building things and fixing things. Oftentimes, I'm using the wrong tool for the job, and my neighbor comes over and says. Dude, that's not the right tool. Get this tool and you'll be able to do the job better. Skills, okay, skills, how, what you do, and then using the right tools. Does my wife use scissors for quilting anymore? No, that's not the most up-to-date tool. She has this mat, I forgot to bring it. She has this mat and a, that, that has lines on it and measurements, and she has a wheel. This thing can cut fingers right off. She has this wheel, and she cuts the fabric with the wheel. She's got all the tools. Okay, She has all the tools. She's learned the skills okay, of piecing. There's piecing. You have to cut the fabric, then piece it together. All those skills she had to learn. Now, what would be perhaps the easiest way or the best way 
to learn the skills once you know the vocabulary. What's that? Before you even practice. First thing my wife did when she took up quilting was she read all about it. We have quilting magazines still, which is interesting. Isn't that fascinating? Even master quilters are still learning the vocabulary. They're still reading about it. They're still researching how to be better at it. Just saying. Okay. No, what she did was she went and she observed two people in our family who had been quilting all their lives. She'd sit there and watch them and say, well, why do you do that? Well, what's that called? Well, is there a trick to doing that? So she observed the master. She observed some masters, quilters, some master craftspeople. And from that, then started to practice her own craft. First thing she made was this table runner. When she finished it, she gave it to my mom, who was the quilter she observed. That's kind of, that's kind of gives you chills, doesn't it? That, that was the first one she did. So there are, there are, there's that part of it. Now, if we're likening this craft to teaching, and you already put the dots together. You know, the knowledge, there's a knowledge base for teaching when it comes to presentation styles, pedagogy, all right? That's the knowledge, the vocabulary of teaching, okay? And then there's the, the skills and the tools. You know, we know that PowerPoint is one tool, okay? If we use it as the only tool, it becomes the devil. PowerPoint is the devil. PowerPoint takes great teachers and turns them into pretty good narrators. <laughs> it really does. I'm not saying power, I don't use PowerPoint. I do. And I use it a lot. I'm in horticulture. I have images to show. And I connect words with those images. So yes, it's a great tool. However, this is a tool as well. What is this? These are pruning shears. These, these are pruners. They're used to cut things. Cut branches. Okay. Could you dig a hole with this pruner? You could. <laughs> Two things happen when you use pruners to dig a hole. Number one, the hole isn't as good as it would be if you used the right tool to dig that hole, right? A shovel would do a much better job, or a trowel, than a pair of pruners. So the hole might be not very good. Secondly, you ruin the tool. It, it's no longer effective for what it needs to be. So we've got all these tools for, at our disposal for teaching, and we stick to one. The silver bullet of teaching, it's PowerPoint. And as a result, the tool itself becomes ineffective even when it would be used appropriately because we use it too much. Okay? We don't in it, we use it for the wrong thing. Henceforth, I didn't bring PowerPoint today. No PowerPoint, sorry. Okay? Yeah, but you brought a handout. Yeah, but you don't get it till the end. <laughs> so I'm gonna leave this tool up here. Oh, by the way, take care of your tools. It says a little holster you put it in there. You wear it. <laughs> um, craft, back to craft. So, you know, quilting, craft, we're done, right? There's a third prong to every craft. What is that third prong? Exploration. Craft, knowledge, skills. So my wife designed this, okay? She, she, she chose, she went in and she picked some tree patterns, but she created this wall hanging for my office. All right, and she chose to put this tree, the tree of temptation, next to this tree, the tree of something else, and next to this tree, she, she chose these trees and she picked this design, and then, you, know, you can't see it very well, but on, the, on the, the side of it, there are leaves that have been quilted in the side. And these leaves she lifted out of the Manual of Woody Plants by Michael Durr, which is the textbook I used for the course that I taught. And she etched those in here. And this hung in my office for 25 years. What is that third prong to the quilting to this craft? Starts with A. It's the creative part. The creative part is what brings this all together. Isn't it the creative part that makes this hers? This is, you can, I, I look at this, I say, this is a Sue Lane quilt right here. Okay? How, why is it a Sue Lane quilt and not a Jane Lane quilt or some other person's quilt? Because she took her own creative ability, her own artistic ability, and she put it here. Now, now here's the punchline. I get chills thinking about this. This sat in my office for over 20 years. One day I'm sitting there looking at the quilt like I would. That's why it's faded, by the way. Because, okay. And I'm looking at it, and all of a sudden I, I'm looking at this tree. Does anybody see anything wrong with this tree? Anything 
weird with this tree? I'm not going to belabor it, but you see how the apples are all like this on this tree? See it? The fruit? <laughs> this sat in my office for over 20 years. I never saw this. All of a sudden, I'm sitting there, I look, I go, oh my gosh, you made a mistake. <laughs> I called her on the phone, I said, you won't believe this, I found a mistake on the tree quilt. She said, it took you over 20 years. <laughs> now, this mistake, I, I am so thankful that she made that mistake. In fact, in, in quilting, in quilting, and this is what's so cool, but in quilting, quilts are considered more valuable when you can find a goof. When you can find a goof, that adds value to the quilt. Now think about this as teachers. This is a craft, vocabulary, <clears throat> skills, tools, and then we take who we are, our own creative ability, and we, we mix it into that. We craft our own teaching style, okay? And sometimes we get it wrong, but that's what makes it so much more special. It's really amazing. It's like, oh my gosh, I, I just, I value this quilt because, and when I heard you guys talking about some of the outstanding teachers, you were talking about things that they did that made them outstanding, but that some of you actually heard little things like, well, you know, he did this funny thing, this little quirk. This little unique and interesting, you know, I bet the best teachers you had made some very interesting little errors and mistakes when it came to the tools they chose or the knowledge that they had or whatever. But they took their own cells, their creative part, and they applied it to that. Isn't that cool? Okay, since we're talking about both, I couldn't, I was like, bring one or the other. And then I said, hey, it's my workshop. I'm going to bring both. <laughs> so check this one out. All right. <laughs> so here's the story behind this quilt. You're going to love this, okay? 25th wedding anniversary, my wife gives me my anniversary present. It's this. My wife gave me a quilt for our 25th wedding anniversary. I open it up, I look at it, I go, oh, it's a quilt. I'm looking for a car, or maybe a tool for the garden. She gives me a quilt. I'm thinking, well, this is odd. And then she said, well, don't you recognize it? I said, nope, never seen it before. She's been working on this secretly, never showed me which, what it was. And she said, Bryce, I've collected the shirts that you've worn to work for the past 20 years. <laughs> and she said, and I took them and cut fabric out, and I created this piece, this pieced quilt together with all the shirts that you've worn over the years at NC State. All of a sudden, this quilt became, oh, you gave me a quilt for our anniversary. Isn't that awesome? You can see that in the mid-80s, we wore a lot of pastel. <laughs> okay? But, you know, I mean, so, you know, there's the creativity part again. She chose to use fabric from shirts, okay? Preferably, probably the middle of the back of the shirt. But anyway, there, there you have, uh, oh, and then, of course, she did the little dedication or anything on the back with one of the shirts I wore, and there's the pocket. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? So yeah, so, yeah. so there's, there's my, my, my illustration here for um, teaching is a craft and using quilting as an example. And, you know, I, I didn't, you know, I, I picked quilting and, and I, I ascribed to that philosophy of teaching, but I didn't, you know, I didn't make it up, okay? So here's the first book recommendation. If you want to read about teaching as a craft, a guy by the name of, an educator by the name of Kenneth Evel wrote a book called The Craft of Teaching. The other one that, that relates to teaching as a craft is called The Skillful Teacher. There's that word, skill involved, skillful teacher. But um, I really, really want you to, to, to consider the idea that the, the best teaching has a huge creative name. Okay? That is a very much a reflection of who you are. Okay? Not that that is what makes the best teacher but it's a big part of teaching as, it's, as it goes. So let me pause here because that's kind of like, that's my intro. Now I want to go and say, okay, so how can we become the best crafts teachers that we can be? But when you learn the craft, it's, not, it's about reading about it, learning about the vocabulary, okay? Spending time watching and being around those who already have the skills and abilities to learn the skills and abilities. And then the third part would be to practice. Practice. Even the best artists practice. Even the best athletes practice. 
the very best people who have those abilities that you might say, oh, that's, that's you know, they're a natural. They still practice their craft. Okay. Now, um, let's put it right out there. Does this mean that everybody that teaches can be absolutely, totally outstanding? Does it mean that teachers can learn how to be better teachers and become more proficient at their craft? Yes, but my wife has some skill, she has some natural abilities that facilitate her design and her talent that are better than others and worse than others. And that's the reality of the situation. By the way, this quilt took honorable mention at the NC State Fair. Okay? She's won first place on her quilts at the NC State Fair and won nothing showing quilts at the NC State Fair. But nonetheless, it's, it's a reflection of her ability to learn and apply, but also those natural abilities that she has. I'm just being really honest and realistic about if we ascribe the teaching as a craft, then there will be teachers who are absolutely outstanding, right? and there will be others who will be good, proficient that may never ever get to the point where they are incredibly outstanding just because of that artistic aspect to it. That's my take on it. It's, it's, not a, it's not a big deal, but it's a huge deal. Because what you have to do is sit down within yourself and say, okay, you know, where am I at and how does it work? Any questions, any comments at this stage? Let's pause here just for a second. Let's see. Even if you're not, I am. So, okay, so that's number one. Teaching is a craft. Number two. Oh, by the way, I got to get this out. Ernest Boyer, in early 1980s, wrote a wrote a publication called Scholarship Reconsidered, and in that in that publication, he claimed that scholarship involves research, okay, discovery, okay, dissemination, extension. But he also called teaching a scholarly activity. Are you saying when you publish in a teaching journal, that's scholarly? No. He said that the very art and science of teaching in and of itself is a scholarly activity. That writing a syllabus is a scholarly activity. Writing an exam is a scholarly activity. And what you put together to teach for learning is a scholarly activity. And he claimed in, his, in, his, in that journal article in 81, 82, he claimed that the uni university system will not change when it comes to looking at teaching as a scholarly activity until the very teachers and the very faculty member at the university faculty members at the university embrace that philosophy. So I ask you, is that philosophy embraced today in higher education? That's a rhetorical question. You don't need to go there. <laughs> But that's an important question relative to your career aspirations. Let's be realistic about this. Because most of you are going to pursue careers that might, you might be asked to do research and possibly teach. Do research and do extension, which is in essence a form of teaching. You've got to ask yourself, okay, am I willing to, what am I willing to, how am I willing to approach that relative to the way my institution looks at that activity? Is it scholarly? Because what I hear is, oh, it's scholarly only if you publish something you did in teaching in a journal. That's not what Boyer was saying. So it's something that you want. Okay? So what is good teaching? Well, literature says this. Subject matter plus a generic methodology. Now, doesn't that sound exciting? Take the subject matter. Okay. And then add it. Take that subject matter and then some sort of method of delivery. We call it download now. Okay, we teachers have become downloaders. And you talk, you listen to people who teach, you can tell the ones who just think to know is to teach because they say, I gotta somehow get this from here to there. Right? Not so fast. I believe that it involves a dynamic, what does the word dynamic mean? Active, lively, moving, a dynamic transformation. What does it mean to transform something? change, okay, a dynamic transformation of your knowledge into something that can be learned. That's what I think it is. It's magical, is it not? You've experienced it. You talked about people who had that ability, who took that, that knowledge, a dynamic transformation of what they knew 
into something where you bought into it. You learned it. Okay? So that's, that's pretty darn exciting. How do you do that? How do you do that? Now, if I've done my job, I have created an environment where you are, you're, going, you're saying with me, yeah, how do you do that? I want to know. Do we have time? And the answer is yes, we do. <laughs> we do. We've got time. Okay, so how do we do that? And we have more time. There it is. Okay, so how do we do that? How do we create a positive environment for learning? Because that's the rest of today's workshop. Creating a positive environment for learning. So that when you walk into that lab that you have to teach, that you are actually thinking about what I can do to create a positive environment for learning. Because can't make people learn. Sorry, you can't. You can't motivate students. You can't make them learn. Students are motivated. They might be motivated to do this during your whole class. They're motivated. They're just not motivated to engage in what's going on in your classroom. So my question is, what can we do to create an environment where if students choose to engage, they'll learn? Because to me, that's the secret. Okay. I'm an environmentalist. That's what I am. And it's my job, my job as a teacher, to create an environment where you, if you chose to, to engage, by the way, I'm happy to say that each and every one of you are fully engaged right now, and I can see that. <laughs> okay, I know it. That's great. That gives me chills. I get excited because that's happening because somehow I've managed to create that environment. Now I have to sustain that environment. Okay. What's, what's, what, what kills the classroom environment? Kills it. Yeah. Immediately. Starts with a B. Ends in order. <laughs> Would you agree? Okay. I tell my students in class, if you get bored, raise your hand and say, I'm bored. Because it's my job to create an environment where you wouldn't be bored. Okay, now, students will choose not to engage even in an environment that's not boring. But it makes it a lot easier to disengage if it is boring. Oh, so we have to be entertainers. In a matter of speaking, yes, we do. To a certain degree, we do have to create that environment where we capture their attention. We'll talk about that in a little while. So, creating a positive environment for learning. Step number one, get their attention. Get their attention. Okay, take one of these, take two. I don't know, take a few, pass them around. Okay, go ahead, there you go. Get their attention. Part of getting their attention, there's a, it's three prongs to getting attention. One, as teachers, I believe we need to create a sense of awe. A-W-E, awe. Create a sense of awe. Okay, so in college education, it looks something, it looks something like this. I'm about to share with you something called the circle of learning. All right? So, the first thing I'm going to put up here is the circle. So there's learning. <clears throat> and there are different prongs along this circle that relate to certain parts of learning. All right, so at the top of the circle right here, I'm going to write romance. Uh-oh. Romance. Okay, and then in parentheses I'm going to put awe. I'm talking about what we can do to create a positive environment for learning. Step number one get their attention. Part of getting their attention is creating a sense of awe. We need to romance our students. Careful. We need to romance our students. We need to create some level of awe. Okay? Because, because of the second prong of learning, by the way, this, this is where we all start as teachers. Precision. Precision is also translated as drudgery. Would you not all agree there are certain parts to learning that are repetitive, we need to get them in, it's the, 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 the equation, it's the calculation, it's the memorizing, that's all hard, it's all not fun, yes? Why would we want to do this? I mean, walk into a college class and the teacher says, all right, today we're going to talk about photosynthesis, the equation for photosynthesis is... So we're starting right here. 
There's a whole quarter of a circle that we haven't even addressed yet. So, I teach plant identification. There's this tree called ginkgo. It produces beautiful yellow fall color like this. Look at that. What do you notice about that leaf? Well, observations. Help me out. Observations. Just scream them out. What do you see? It's yellow. It's yellow. <laughs> Would you not say butter yellow? Yeah. Is it completely yellow, or do some of you have leaves that have a little bit of green? Green. Yeah. Yeah. They're in transition. Okay, what else do you notice? It's a fan. It's a fan. Look at that. It's fan shaped. How many of you seen leaves that look like fan? No, there aren't many out there. The horticulturists may have. It's a fan. There's a term we use to describe this fan. You notice how the veins all seem to fan out? That's called dichotomous venation. It's a fan. Isn't that cool? Okay, did you know that these leaves, there are fossils of these leaves that have been found that date millions of years back. This, this is one of the oldest living species on Earth. Fossils of ginkgo leaves have been discovered even right here in North Carolina. Did you know that right now this tree is covered with these butter yellow leaves? And any day now, the head leaf, because there is a head leaf, the head leaf will send an email out to all the other leaves. Well, let me be current. The head leaf will send out a text message <laughs> to all the other leaves, and the text message will say, tonight we drop. And tomorrow morning, every leaf will be on the ground. And there's no other tree that does that in the world. Is that not cool? Ginkgo, all the leaves turn bright yellow, and then they all fall off all at once one night. And you wake up the next morning, there's a carpet of yellow leaves. One leaf left up in the tree. Claims didn't get the text. <laughs> so, this is nothing more than a romantic introduction to this tree, to learning about trees. I could have started with Ginkgo biloba, maidenhair tree, is a tree that grows 30 to 50 feet tall. It has yellow leaves with dichotomous venation. Da -da 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 -da. I could go on for 10 minutes about that tree. And not one of you might have been interested at all. Now you're going, uh, could you tell me more about the ginkgo? Because there's more. <laughs> but I'm not going to tell you right now. You're going to have to come back to class. Romance. What can you do about yourself? What can you do about chemical engineering that would get students excited about chemical engineering? Or about one aspect of chemistry? Biggest problem with a lot of these basic science courses is even the teachers don't communicate why they fell in love with that subject matter. Tell a story about what makes you so passionate about differential equation. An application, something that gets students going, oh, I want to learn about this. Just, just thinking about this. Because once a student's romance, once they, oh, then uh, would you not be more willing to do this? Be more willing to do this? Okay, I'll learn the formulas. I'll learn the formulas. I'll get that information. I'll develop though that I'll learn that vocabulary. Create a sense of awe, number one. Two, two, to get their attention, and I've already kind of emulated that is we need to be passionate about what we teach. Because let's face it, learning's about personality. My grandkids love to come over and go outside with me because, you know, Poppy, can you imagine my grandfather's name is a plant? Poppy. <laughs> That's great. You know, Poppy loves outside. We always like, this is my five-year-old grandson, Lane, talking. I always like to go outside with Poppy because he shows me something that's really neat. Seeds that explode. And this, he's learning all about plants, and I haven't done anything like, <laughs> you know, we're here. And we're going to stay there. He's my grandson. I'm not going here. I'm going to let somebody else take him there. Okay? But I'm going to do this. Okay? But he knows that I'm passionate about my subject matter. He knows I'm passionate about those things. Outside, oh, go. Yeah, talk to Poppy. He, he loves trees. Poppy loves trees. Okay. So why does he connect with that? Because people connect with other people. People don't connect with subject matter. They connect with people. They connect with people. Get their attention. How do you get their attention? Create a sense of awe, be passionate. Oh, by the way, is it important to be genuinely passionate about your subject matter? Can you smell when a teacher's just faking it? Yeah, just like, just like a dog can smell fear, students can smell a disingenuous approach. Okay? 
So here's my point. If indeed someday you want to teach, you need to be 100% on board with being genuine about being passionate about your subject matter. We'll get back to that. Okay, number three, rel under get their attention. Change your behavior. Okay? Energy, enthusiasm, commitment. Change your behavior. Kenneth Ebel says, Kenneth Ebel says, it's a performing art. Teaching is a performing art. It involves diction. It involves movement. It involves pace. These are all aspects of performance. Why well, uh, did the Myers Briggs and I'm an introvert and I can't? That's beside the point. Half half of Hollywood are introverts. Somehow they're great actors. Why? Because they've studied the vocabulary. They've learned the skills. They've practiced with the masters, and they've taken their own personality and incorporated it. It's a performing art. There's a certain aspect of performance. Now, I know what you're doing. You're looking at me going, I can't be like you. I never asked you to be like me. This is me being me. You need to be like you. If you, you need to be like you. If you understand that people need to hear you clearly and you're a soft-spoken person, can you do something about that? Two things you can do about it. Take voice lessons and be louder or put on a microphone. You can do one or the other. As long as you facilitate that, that's part of the performance. And the last part about getting their attention, triple A. Be respectful of them now. It's all about respect. Respect. So what are the triple A's? Accessible, approachable, and your attitude. Those are the three things. Accessibility, approachability, and attitude, the three A's. It's about respect. Here's my point. My point is that your students deserve your respect as their teacher. Notice that I didn't say that it's my opinion that they need to earn your respect as their teacher. No. You're a professional. You're a teacher. You demand. Yeah, I, 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 I look at it as th that relationship in and of itself requires me to be respectful of, of the students. Yeah, but what if, what if they treat me like just garbage? That's not the point. That's your job is to be respectful. That's my opinion. And I'll, and I'll be, I'll be, you know, it's true confessions. When I was a, first year I was a teacher, if a student fell asleep in my class, eraser, bink, right off the top of their head. Sorry, child. You weren't even asleep, but I had to, you know, it was for effect. Okay? I would beat them off the top of the head with the eraser. They fell asleep. Nobody was falling asleep in my class. Total lack of respect. I remember coming home from work one day, my arms crossed and said to my wife, I got seven today. She said, you got seven what? Dean seven students over the head of the race, so they fell asleep in my class. Nobody falls asleep in my class. And she said, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. Now, my wife is not only a great quilter, but she's also a very wise person. <laughs> she said to me, what makes you think that your students are all going to be like you were when you were a student? She says, is it possible that maybe one of the students who fell asleep in your class actually had a good reason to fall asleep in your class? I said, like what? She said, well, like maybe they have a family member who's in the hospital and they've been sitting up all night with them every night for the past five nights. I said, well, I doubt very strongly. She says, that's not the point. The point is, is it possible that maybe somebody's falling asleep in your class because they have narcolepsy, which I've had in my class? And hit me like a brick. I have a responsibility to respect my students, to behave in a way that's respectful. If my class starts at 10 o'clock, then I should be there at 10 of 10. I need to be available to my students. Not only do I need to have office hours, but I need to tell them that they can come and make an appointment and talk to me. I need to show them that I want them to learn. That's my obligation as a professional educator. I need to be respectful, approachable. I need to be approachable. Yeah, yeah what do you want? Right after class. Yeah, what, uh, yeah, yeah, uh-huh, mm-hmm. That's disrespectful. Showing respect means you show you care. So I stop Just throwing erasers. And now I look out and someone's asleep. I give them the benefit of the doubt. In that gap between expectation, in that gap between expectation and reality, there's a gap. I can put one of two things in there as a teacher. I can put in there, <clears throat> believe the best, or I can put in there, assume the worst. It was my, it's my choice, right? So now, I put in there, believe the best. Yeah, but Bryce, you're going to be taken as a fool. Mm -hmm. I just soon be taken as a fool three times, so that the one time where I need to give them the benefit of the doubt and they deserve it, they get it. 
because there's nothing worse than somebody who needs the benefit of the doubt, someone who deserves the benefit of the doubt, and as a teacher, I don't give it to them. That can crush somebody's spirit. So yes, I'll play the fool. Now, this is 30 years of teaching talking, more than 30 years of teaching talking. When I first started this gig. Okay. So that's that's something that's grown, that's transformed in my own philosophy of teaching. But it's something I feel very strongly about. Because I've hurt students emotionally by what I've done up in front of the class. And you will. If you're going to be a good teacher, you risk. There's a huge amount of risk involved. And sometimes you'll fail. And it will have repercussions, just like the positive has repercussions. So, get their attention. That's number one. Two, get to know your students and let them get to know you. Get to know them. How do you get to know your students? Who are those guys? Do you know that the freshman class, this fall's freshman class, was born in 1994? <laughs> 1994. I was in class. I was showing them this big, giant oak stump that, was, that fell down in my backyard, this huge oak tree that fell down. It was, it was huge. And it was a big stump. And I said, I've done research on this stump. This stump is as big as the Mercury space capsule. And was, finally, somebody raised their hand back. I said, yes. They said, what? what is a Mercury space capsule? <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. We, we, before we went to the moon. We had to try to get up into space. And the way we tried to get up into space is on the top of a big giant torpedo. <laughs> and we stuck this little capsule and put one guy in there. And we said, we'll pray for you. And <laughs> off he went. And that little capsule was called a Mercury space capsule. It's at the Smithsonian. And that's what I said to the young lady. She was, oh, it's a Mercury space capsule. I said, haven't you ever been to the Smithsonian? <laughs> the what? <laughs> we need to understand who our students are. We need to understand that this thing is something that never wasn't there for them. For me, oh, I have lots of years where I can talk about the better time where we didn't have to be connected to everybody, and yet I go nowhere without this. Okay, Let's stop talking about how it was always better back when. Okay, No, this is reality. This this is part of their existence. I'm not going to, I am not going, to, I'm going to learn more about how they use this. You guys were talking about tweeting. I was going, I should know about that. I should get involved in that. I should text my students rather than email them. I should try to stay current with who they, this is about who they are. And as teachers, we have this obligation to try to stay with. Okay, I'm not saying we need to be like that. It's not like we need to be in the same club. Because I'm 55 years old, I can't be in the same club as a 21-year-old 20, or a 20-year-old. They'll tell me that very quickly if I try to be in their club, okay? <laughs> but I can be current. I can understand them better. Because that <laughs> makes me a better teacher. It doesn't mean I'm going to be like them. It doesn't mean I'm going to be with them all the time, okay? What it means is I understand them, and therefore what I do as a teacher, okay, is influenced by who they are. And I'm sensitive to who. Students today are no less bad than they were 30 years ago. Today, if a student's in class and I've created an environment that they choose not to engage in, they'll just pick up their phone or their tablet or their computer, and they'll do whatever they do on this thing. So the web, text, game, whatever it is they're going to do it, they've chosen not to engage. 30 years ago, if a student chose not to engage, they would pick another student to choose not to engage, and they'd write notes to each other. Or they'd pick up this thing called the newspaper, and they'd just read the newspaper. Same difference. But there are more disengaging them. No, same number. It's just what they use, what they do when they disengage. <coughs> students aren't any worse than they were 30 years ago. They're not any better than they were 30 years ago. They're just students. We need to know who they are. Build rapport. Build rapport. How do you get to know them and let them get to know you? Build rapport. What's the best and easiest way to build rapport? Humor. Right? Okay. So, in our lessons plan, we write, be funny. It doesn't work. I got news for you. It doesn't work. But, first day of class, I got the syllabus. Some of you heard me tell the story before. I don't care. It's a good one. I got the syllabus. 
I'm in the class, I'm talking about all the great things we're going to do this semester, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, you know, and they're just, just watching me and it's quiet, no reports, the first day of class, they don't know me, I don't know them, you know, we're going along and I have, a, I have an indelible pen and I'm checking off the different things and I go and I put it back in my pocket, but instead I put it back in my pocket with the cap like this. It was a Sharpie. Okay, and they don't pay me to advertise Sharpies, but it was like this, I put it back in there. I had a white shirt on with a tie. Little black dots formed right there. Okay, and there were students this far away. And the dots started to grow. <laughs> it got to be about the size of a quarter, no one said a word. I'm going on, just don't get into it. And this thing's getting bigger. I'm like, and it got about this big. <laughs> and finally, a student in the front row looked at me and went, <laughs> that was the extent of their, hey, buddy, you got something wrong with your shirt. And I looked down and I went, oh my gosh! And, and I had them. Everybody cracked up. We all laughed. Rapport. Instant rapport. I let humor happen. Okay? And in fact, I actually thought, you know, it'd be worth a white shirt for every <laughs> The only problem with that is I don't know that I could pull it off as an accident. Because I'd walk into class, you know, <laughs> okay, today we're going to, <laughs> you know, and then, it, you know, so, so let, let, I've, you know, I've trimmed, you let humor happen, and you don't, you don't squelch that humor, you let it happen when you build that rapport. Let your teaching reflect your personality. Does, did anybody ever, did they, was anyone here when the Ansel Adams exhibit was at the museum? You know who Ansel Adams is, they're a great photographer. When you walk up to an Ansel Adams photograph, you don't go, this is a photograph taken by Ansel Adams. What do you say? Ooh, that's an Ansel Adams. So really, what are you saying? What is that photograph really communicating? Besides his skill and his vocabulary about photography and his ability, what, what else does it communicate? We call it an Ansel Adams. Is his personality not coming out of that photograph as well? You know, I don't want people to take a course to wrestling teach. I oh, want people to take a wrestling. Let your personality come out in the classroom. Do you think that I just started this workshop by telling you about how long, how, where I came from, who I'm married to, how long I was married, my grandkids, just because I wanted to tell you about that? Yeah, I did want to tell you about that because that, that gave you the opportunity to know a little bit more about me. All of a sudden, now I'm going to tell you stories like, this guy's real. He's a real person. I'm gonna, I'm, I may listen. Of course, there's a big R associated with that. What is it? Risk. Risk. Breaking down the walls. Make it personal. I don't mean you have to talk about yourself or something personal all the time, but make it personal. People are drawn to people. They're not drawn to stuff. They're drawn to people. And when you make it personal, should have seen the guy from the physical plant, the landscape guy with the leaf blower, looking at me when I'm out there pulling leaves off the tree. See, now I'm telling you a little personal story about how, you know, the, the landscape services guy thought I was nuts grabbing leaves like this, and I waved to him and off I went. Mm -hmm. <laughs> get to know your students, let them get to know you. Next one, be student-centered. It's all about them. It's really all about them. We used to take students on field trips. We still do take students on field trips. Jared's actually been on a few field trips. The old field trips, oh, we map out the gardens we're going to, and then we we decide what it was we wanted them to learn about the gardens. This is the garden you're going to see, and here's a little paragraph you need to read about the garden that you're going to see. By the way, this is all extra. This was not classroom related. This was extracurricular. Come on the fall field trip to go see gardens. Okay, and then the next one, and then on the bus, we'd be riding up to the garden, and I'd pull out my little thing and say, okay, today we're gonna to be seeing this garden here, and these, this is the history, and blah, 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 and I, I tell them everything that I wanted them to learn about that garden. Right? And we'd give the handout, and after the first day, the handout would be in the track. Next day, they get on the bus. Where are we going today? It's on your handout. I don't have my handout. It occurred to me that I wasn't being student-centered relative to that trip. That for some of my students going up to the Delaware Valley region of the northeast section of the United States, they'd never been out of North Carolina. 
And here I am worried about them understanding the history of Longwood Gardens and Pierre's Dupont and blah, blah, blah. And they're going, oh, I'm in Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> or to take somebody from Johnston County off a farm to France. And I'm going to tell him what I want him to learn about a specific garden, when for him to get on that plane and go to France in and of itself was the most incredible learning experience he's ever had. I need to know who they are, where they're coming from, and then I need to let them learn by discovery within that context. Learning by discovery has become my little mantra there. These student centers about them. So here are some things. The three C's. If you, the three C's. Caring. <coughs> Caring and caring, okay? Great teachers care about the students. Great teachers care about teaching. And great teachers care about their subject. I've never had a student in my office complaining about a class that they're taking where they said, the teacher's knowledge is sub suspect. No, what did they say when they came in the office and they said, that teacher doesn't care. And I'll go, what are they doing? don't they care about? Well, they don't care about me. Why? Because they behave in ways that don't show that they, they care about me. Well, why, what else don't, don't, don't you like that course? Well, they don't, they don't really want to teach. They don't really want to be there. They came in first day of class and said, so I'm so retired and I got slapped with this responsibility, so now you're stuck with me. They said they don't care about teaching. Or they come in and they just say, today, Photosynthesis equation is get out your pens. They don't they don't care about their subject matter. They don't show any passion, any enthusiasm, any care for their it's all about caring. The best teachers are the ones who cared about all three. So as you look at your career opportunities in front of you, if teaching is part of that, and you know that the best teachers and students understand when teachers care for them, care for teaching, and care for their subject matter, can you reconcile not caring for one of those three and still be a teacher? I'm just asking you. I don't want you to answer that right. <laughs> Other things I've got written down here. Anything you can do to reduce anxiety increases learning. First day of class, always put students in groups of three and give them an assignment. Get to know each other. What do you expect to learn in this class? I'm lowering the anxiety level because a lot of the classes I teach are full of students who don't know each other. Once they get to know each other, that energy level goes up, that learning opportunity goes up. What can you do to reduce anxiety? Maybe the first quiz you give them, you give it to them such that they can all make 100 on it. That reduces anxiety. Ah, oh, that's successful. I mean, I've learned this. You know, The last thing I want to do is correct my five-year-old grandson. Nope, sorry, that's wrong. No, I encourage them. And when they get something right, I encourage them even more. Oh, that's great. Let's go over and look at this. And then we get in the classroom, college classroom, we say, nope, sorry, that's wrong. Can't believe you said that. Be genuine about your business. Students can generally tell in 10 minutes if you're not being genuine about your business. It takes less than 10 minutes. Can you be flexible and creative? Can you agree to do a workshop that's going to take an hour and a half? and see that it's 11.15 and know that you're not even halfway done and be able to still go on and do something with that? Can you be flexible enough to handle that? Because you need to be. That's being student-centered. Stress the positive, be encouraging, be confirming. Oh, and <laughs> my favorite, don't be afraid of the F word. The F word. Second year of teaching, I come out of my office. One of the senior professors in the department called me into his office. He said, um, I'm speaking on behalf of some of the other professors in the department. We're concerned about your teaching. I said, yes, sir. He says, you're having too much fun in the classroom. I said, and what's wrong with that? Well, if students are having that much fun, they can't be learning. Quote, unquote. I said, uh, I'm sorry, I disagree. So the more fun they have, the more they probably are learning. He said, well, how do you see that? And I said, well, you know, I said, people go to the movies all the time. They watch a two and a half hour movie and they don't move from that seat. They don't bring a notebook and they don't take notes during that movie. And then two weeks after they've been to that movie, they're sitting at a coffee shop with a friend and they say, have you seen this movie? And the friend says, no. They say, you want to know what it's about? Yeah. Well, who's in it? Well, so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so's in that movie. 
You know, what's it about? Oh, the plot is, it starts out where, blah, 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 blah. I mean, that, that person who went to that movie for entertainment purposes, to have fun, didn't take a note, can somehow recount all that. It, they, it's, like, they, it's not like, oh, wait a minute, you want to know the plot? Okay, hold on a second, let me check my notes. And Yes, the plot starts with, oh, so what is it about that fun part? I always like the beginnings of the James Bond they always create a sense of awe and romance. I'm not talking about him with a woman. I'm talking about somehow he's flying through the air, going to die if it was me. <laughs> <laughs> so by the end of the intro, before the, before the first credits of the beginning of the movie, before the music even starts, I'm already like, oh, I want to lie. I got, oh, I'm there. I'm engaged. I'm totally 100% engaged. We were joking around a little bit before everybody got here about, you know, I said, oh, someday I'm going to teach a course called Extreme Horticulture. And the lights will come down, and I'll come in with a chainsaw. We were all laughing about it. But you know what? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you just wonder. What if we put our class, what if we put chemical engineering to music? We wrote songs about differential equations. Just wonder, my, my daughter, when she was little, my youngest daughter, Megan, would sit in front of the TV and she could sing every television commercial that ever came on. And yet she struggled with math. I'm thinking, well, what if we could put math to a jingle? I mean, we laugh about these things, but somehow there's that entertainment value, that fun thing that somehow just, just completely goes into the core of our ability to learn. Learning can be fun. <laughs> I was over at the gym. I spend a lot of time at the gym. I love to play racquetball. I like working out. Over at the gym, they have a rock climbing wall. Have you seen it? And these guys rock climb. You know, they practice rock climbing. So I happened to peek in one day, and there was a guy on the wall, roped in, chalk all over his fingers, and he was practicing, right? Slipping, sweating. One finger had had a cut on it. It was bleeding. Honestly, I walked over. I said, you like that? Oh, I love this. I said, really? I said, is it hard work? He says, oh my gosh, it's hard work. You have to practice, you have to practice, you have to practice. And I said, yeah, it hurts. Oh, my muscles, when I first started, I'd wake up in the morning, my muscles would hurt. He said, I've learned more and more, I'm getting better at it. I said, why do you do it? If it's so much work, why do you do it? And what was his answer? Because it's fun. What? It's fun? Yeah, it's so much fun. I said, why is it so much fun? He says, it's so much fun. Ready for this? He said, it's so much fun that once you learn all the technique, all the skill and everything, he says, you can go out and you can do it. And he said, and when you do it, you get a big rush. Okay. So if I'm a college teacher, I'm going to start here. Oh, rock climbing it is the bomb. Yeah, is it the bomb? Yeah, look, see that little dot up on the rock up there? Yeah, that's a person. Oh, wow, you could do that. Really? Yeah, what do I have to do? Well, you have to learn how. Oh, you're going to work, you're going to bleed, you're going to sweat. Drudgery over and over and over again. But at one point, when you do master that, you get to do it. And when you do it, it's a rush. First plan ID course I ever, I ever took as, a, as a, a junior in college at the University of Connecticut, I took this plan ID course. Philip Carpenter was the teacher. And it was fall semester. I went through fall semester plan ID. I learned 250 different species of plants, learned their scientific names, everything. Okay. I remember, I misspoke. It was spring semester. I remember going home for the summer, working at the garden center. But I got two weeks off to go on our family vacation to the Jersey Shore of all places. Went to the Jersey Shore on the drive, the six hour drive down. Halfway on the trip, my dad pulled over on the Garden State Park. He said, Get out. I'm like, what? He said, I don't want to hear another plant name for the rest of the trip. <laughs> because we were driving down the road, and was going, Hey, look, there's a Skyanopides reticulata. And he'd go, What's that? I'd say, It's a Japanese umbrella pine. And then he'd a little bit further. And after three hours of that, <laughs> pulls over, says, get out. I'm like, what? He said, don't do that anymore. What was I doing? Right here. 
I was taking what I learned and I was applying it to just the very environment I was in. The circle was complete. And what's so cool about the circle is if within a laboratory or a classroom we can manage to do this, then it's self-romance. We, we, we don't have to spend as much time on the romance part because students romance themselves as a result of that. The circle of learning, romance, precision, application, back to romance again. What do students say is associated with good teaching? I asked you earlier, you, we put some words up there. There was significant research done, pedagogical research work. Student upon student upon student survey. What makes teachers great? Come up with a list of five, and these are not necessarily in the order of which one was the number one, two, three, four, okay? What students said, number one, clarity. This is a skill that can be learned, clarity. Learning how to explain things clearly. Two, caring attitude. Great teachers care about teaching, about, about their discipline, and about students. Three, great teachers are organized. In fact, they've done little studies where teachers would walk into one classroom without any notes, nothing, and teach. And then they go into another classroom with a notebook, and they teach. Same lecture. Teacher wouldn't even look at the notebook. And the class where the teacher brought the notebook in identified the teacher as more organized than the teacher that didn't bring the notebook. So I always bring a thumb drive with Matthew Webb. That's my notebook. Knowledgeable. Yes, knowledge is respected and appreciated by students. And the last one is enthusiasm. Great teachers are enthusiastic. So the question I would ask you is, if teaching is about style, if it's a craft that's about style, then what's your style? Not what's my style. What you saw here today, that's me. It's what my grandkids see, it's what my wife sees, sometimes for the good, sometimes for the bad, okay? When I'm enthusiastic, I do jump around. I wave my arms, I raise my voice. That all comes naturally. And I've identified the fact that that's what I do when I'm excited about things. So what, how do I apply that? I take that knowledge and I apply it to my subject matter. I apply it to my teaching. Do I overplay it? Maybe sometimes, but no. What do you do? It's about your style. It's not about my style. It's, it takes some real hard looking to see what your, what's your style. It's about style.